Do you want to find out what the experts in distilled spirits businesses have to say about managing and operating a distillery? Well, you should probably check out the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's a six-course online program taught in part by real corporate fellows, meaning that you're getting real experience from real experts at the most renowned distilleries, companies, and startups in the distilling industry. We're talking leaders from Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and more. So get enrolled into this fully online program at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. You know, after our Meltdown Ice Press video went viral on TikTok and Instagram, every person that comes over to my house, they want to see it in action. So I put on a block of ice, put the top on it, and you watch the melted water drip down the groove channels and you end up with a perfect sphere. Stunning is easily the best word to describe it. Go get one of your own at MeltdownIce.com. If you're looking to upgrade your sleep, do it today with a bare mattress. You're guaranteed to get the proper back support, pressure relief, and comfort or your money back. Every bare mattress is proudly made in the USA and comes with two free pillows. Try the top-rated bare mattress risk-free for 100 nights. You can learn more at baremattress.com slash bourbon. That's B-E-A-R mattress.com slash bourbon. It all started when we went with our dad to buy a quarter of a cow worth of meat from a butcher. That's how any good (laughs) story goes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This is episode 296 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's podcast, talking about Bell Mead and Nelson's Greenbrier, here's your weekly bourbon news update. For years now, we've been talking about the tariffs between the U.S. and the European Union going tit for tat over a trade dispute completely unrelated to alcohol, but it's been a casualty in the trade war. However, some good news is finally coming out. The United States and the European Union have agreed to temporarily suspend tariffs for the next four months that have been levied on billions of dollars of each other's aircraft, wine, food, bourbon, scotch, and all kinds of other products as both sides tried to find a negotiated settlement. Flavored whiskey brand Brown Sugar Bourbon has announced that they have a new owner, and that person is no other than Jamie Foxx. Foxx will guide the creative direction and lend his entrepreneurial spirit to help further the brand's expansion. Well, and here we go, another celebrity in the bourbon category. So let's go on and move on to bourbon release news. Barrel Craft Spirits has released Barrel Bourbon Batch 28. It's a blend of 10 and 11 year old barrels from Tennessee, Kentucky, and Indiana, bottled at cash strength, which is 108.86 proof, and has a suggested price of $90. And now moving on to some bourbon pursuit news, because happy birthday to us, we just turned six years old. We're incredibly fortunate that there are a lot of listeners out there like you that want to hear more from the people behind your favorite brands. The podcast has grown immensely, and we just want to take a second to thank our sponsors, our Patreon community, and all of you loyal listeners. Thank you very, very much. For some news on the Bourbon Pursuit Private Barrel Club, we are rocking and rolling with more barrel picks. Last week, we selected three barrels at Bullet Distilling Company, and this week, we selected a Remus barrel from MGP, another Old Forester barrel proof, And we're also getting lined up to do some at Wild Turkey, Knob Creek, Four Roses, Ezra Brooks, and a ton more. We're going to be pushing 40 barrels selected again this year, so make sure you support the podcast. And you can get your hands on some of these single barrel selections. Plus, you get first access to the seven new Pursuit series that will be coming out over the next few months from places like Finger Lakes Distilling and Woodenville Whiskey Company. Just go to bourbonpursuit.com and click on the Barrel Club link. Barrel Bourbon is known for their expertise in crafting unique blends, taking lots of different whiskeys from different regions and bottling it at cask strength. And you can even buy them online now. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Nate Gordon, who writes me on FredMinnick.com. Actually, a very, very deep message here, but the one thing I will pull out is, I wonder if you could offer some advice for loved ones in my life that see this passion in a closed-minded sense. To them, 
It's an excuse to drink alcohol and spend money. To me, it's an avenue to learn about all of the history, science, crafting, and fellowship. Ignoring their perspective, how do I help others understand why I care so much about this new passion? My friend, Nate, I will tell you, I struggled with that as well. When I grew up in a a pretty religious household that did not drink, and when I was recovering from my war demons, it was, you know, kind of thought like maybe I shouldn't be, you know, drinking wine or bourbon at all. And that was brought to my attention of like, you know, you're talented, you can do anything in the world, why are you focusing on bourbon? But to me, it was the passion, it was the history, it was the fellowship you mentioned. That is what it's all about. And look, every family's different. Everybody's going to have their own challenges and their interpersonal relationships with the people who look at bourbon in a negative light. You know, for me, I can only give you the story that worked. And that was when I opened up and I showed the people who had that kind of negative opinion about bourbon. I opened up and I showed them the charities that I was a part of because of bourbon. Now, when they saw the hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of dollars that we were raising for the likes of cancer charities, the Ronald McDonald House, uh, child victims, you know, all the things that we were doing in bourbon to, to make a better life for people, when they saw that, they completely changed their mindset about what bourbon is. And then they suddenly started to see that, you know what, bourbon is not just some intoxicant. It is a culture and a culture of very good people who care about the human existence. In my 15-year career, I've seen people of all walks of life, of all economic backgrounds, of racial backgrounds, of religious beliefs. I've seen people like that everywhere sit in one room and not talk about the things that divide us. They talk about bourbon. And they talk about what bourbon means to them and what bourbon has done for their inner community. So the next time you find yourself challenged by someone in your family, just sit them down. Show them the amount of money that bourbon has raised. Show them the amount of friends that you have made that may be doctors, they may be plumbers. Maybe they are uh, astronauts. There are actual astronauts who listen to this podcast because they love bourbon. And that's the thing. This is one of the few things that we have in life that can bring us together. And so as that person in your family wants to pull you apart from something that you love, just remember, you've got another family over here and it sure tastes good. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you're like Nate and you have a pressing issue that you want to hit me up with for Above the Char, Hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. And hit me up with your idea. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan making our way down to Nashville this time, talking yep. to somebody that is, you know, I think I got introduced to Bell Mead years ago. And I remember, I think it might have been actually talking to our guest brother at Bourbon and Beyond the rain out year when it was in the tent yep. and I remember tasting a bunch of their stuff there and I was like, Oh shit, we gotta get them on the podcast soon. I know it's coming back to me now. Yeah. We were in the media tent and it was like the Noah's Ark flood was going on <laughs> yeah. and, uh, Terrible. and everybody was like curled in this tent and, uh, yeah, it was the first time I ever had the bell meat. I think it was the cash drink. It was at the bar yeah. bourbon company. And I was like, you know what? I've never had that. And I tried, I was like, damn, it's good. You know? And then we're not in Nashville or in Louisville. So it's not like, I mean, there's some bell meat up there, but it's not like we don't get the special releases That's as true. much. That's and true. so, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, I met Charlie on a happy hour we did with Dallas Bourbon Club. And I was like, yeah. it's like, man, he'll be good for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so we say we like to bring people on. You ask them one question, they just talk for 30 minutes. That's, yeah. that's what we want to hear. All right, yeah. so so go. No. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. I'm glad y'all are here. Yeah, <laughs> we're happy to be here. It's got Appreciate a beautiful it. place here. It's mm-hmm. awesome. So you've heard his voice. Now let's go ahead and introduce him. So today on the show, we have Charlie Nelson. He is one of the co-founders of Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery here in Nashville, Tennessee, which you probably know because you've seen the Bell Mead whiskey line at some point. So 
Charlie, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm I'm glad to be here. And uh, hey, long time listener, uh, first time caller. First time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever this yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as I'd mentioned before we started recording, we kind of start the show off with some random icebreaker. And so yours, sorry is, in advance. Oh no, yeah, this, is, this is a good one. Um, what was the best Halloween costume you've ever worn? Oh wow. Um, <laughs> so uh man this is kind of ridiculous I feel uh, so, like he has a good one <laughs> um you know i i like to play basketball and um when i would like play pickup basketball people would make fun of me they'd call me roethlisberger and uh, <laughs> you kind of look like so i was like it? i was like golly i'm a titans fan at roethlisberger you know <laughs> like i don't like the guy and um and I was like, all right, fine. I'm just going to embrace it. I'm going to be Ben Roethlisberger for Halloween. I go to Goodwill. I get like a Steelers, you know, Super Bowl championship T-shirt. And I get Roethl I take a Sharpie and write Roethlisberger on the back. And I think I, I can't remember what number he is, but I, I think he's like. I think seven or something. Okay, so I wrote a nine. Or maybe it's nine. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it was, I wrote the wrong number. And um, on purpose, uh, on accident, <laughs> and then I had to like scratch it out and write the right number. And I cut off the sleeves and had a Titans long sleeve shirt on underneath. And I went downtown Broadway, uh, downtown Nashville that night, and all of a sudden, people started cheering me as I'm walking down Broadway. There, but Steelers fans are insane. They're yeah. everywhere. They're everywhere. carrying their terrible towel. Like, whoa, and, there's Ben. Let's get his autograph. Yeah, and then there's some, I, I don't know if I could share some of the things that were said during that day. <laughs> but, you can, but it's fine with me. Uh, yeah. We're rated explicit, so go yeah, for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, so this was around the time that, or like, I guess, you know, Roethlisberger doesn't have the uh, cleanest um, yeah. of records. <laughs> yeah. He always puts himself in the news somehow. And, and so there, there were some people that just said some off-color things. Anyway, um, so I've just never gotten cheered walking down Broadway, and that was uh, – that was kind of fun. But hey, yeah. maybe after this you will. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, that guy from Bourbon Pursuit, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hear his voice somewhere. What about you, Ryan? Have you ever had a uh, the best Halloween costume for you? I, I'm trying to think. Uh, I had one that I thought it was kind of funny. It was like I had this big yellow rain suit, and I was like, from when I was working on the golf course, and it was like one of those like fisherman ones. I was like, well, why don't I be the Gorton's fish stick guy or something? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And I thought it was so stupid, but people loved it. They were like, it's, you're the fish stick dude. And I don't know. That's <laughs> I, that's the only one that pops up in my head. It's probably not that cool. It's not like being Big Ben and getting <laughs> hooting and hollered at, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I what about say, you? For yeah. me, um, so I'm going to have to cheat a little bit because this was something that, so for senior year back at school, you'd always have like senior dress up day and you, you just kind of like dress as like whatever. And you just had that. And so I dressed as Quail Man from Doug. Mm. If you remember oh, that. Yeah. yeah like yeah. Quail yeah. Man. Uh, underwear Doug. outside the shorts. You had like a belt wrapped around your head and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, it won best costume of the day. So like I said, that was, that was one of my favorite ones. Doug. Yeah. I know any, great, anything in those old, those old Nickelodeon yeah. things, man. They just <laughs> they start, Peter, Patty, what are Manning. you losers doing? <laughs> <laughs> Banging on a trash can. I need to jump on that street show bike. again. Oh, I, I, I bet I could watch. You know, it's like I found Boy Meets World on Disney Plus. I was like, gosh, I love it. Now I need to just find Doug again to watch that over. Oh man, um, it's due for a reboot. In, yeah. In college, uh, I met. I had some friends who were like friends with Topanga from. Oh, gosh, yeah. like, I was actual like, friends. Oh, with yeah. Friends? Oh, like, wow. It's like, oh my gosh, when can Bring you her over? Yeah. <laughs> we never, never what are you did. waiting for? Yeah. <laughs> like beer pong with her. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll kind of switch gears and start talking about whiskey now. I think that's why people are here. Really? I think this is much better. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm getting. We can, we can talk yeah, about. talk about whiskey all the and, time. And, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's talk, about, talk about Doug. Yeah. I want to talk about the pain guys some yeah. more. <laughs> uh, who, did, did you like Corey or would you not like Corey? Oh, I was, I was a Corey fan. You were a Corey fan? I like Corey, yeah. What was his best friend's name? Always wore the leather jacket. Oh, Sean. Sean, yeah. that's right. And yeah. I loved Mr. Fady. I, I don't know. He cracked me up always. It, well, he's the wise man. Yep. He's like he's like Al from Tool Time, right? Uh, that's right. See, we're going to... All right, we're going to go... We're gonna keep going too far. <laughs> yeah, see. <laughs> so let's... All right, to whiskey. Yeah, let's, let's uh, talk about whiskey. A whiskey. Bit. All right, so kind of talk about, uh, you know, you and your brother, the idea, everything, kind of like, how did this journey begin for you all? Yeah. Um, well, it's a long story. Um, 
but it it all started when we went with our dad to buy a quarter of a cow worth of meat from a butcher. That's how um, any good story goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess I was I still had a semester of college left. And um, where'd you go, by the way? I went to Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Yeah. So uh, my my dream was to uh, go play uh, basketball for UCLA and then for the Lakers. I gave up on that dream in like eighth grade when, um, you know, I realized that that just, <laughs> just wasn't, wasn't going to happen. For wasn't yeah. Gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. And then my college counselor was like, you know, you, UCLA is great, but uh, you don't have any chance of getting in unless you are going to get an athletic scholarship. Probably not going to happen. Or you've got like a 4.0 GPA. And so I didn't have that. So anyway, uh, went to Loyola Marymount University and I had a semester left. I was, I had gotten a grant to study like, cave paintings like paleolithic cave paintings in spain italy and france and wow, that's interesting. um yeah and so it was the grant was for like two grand and that barely got me yeah. a plane ticket yeah, there and, say, right, yeah. thanks a lot <laughs> yeah so uh I, I wanted to go for two months and um that just wasn't going to be enough so i came back to nashville to work and uh, while i was working in nashville uh, my dad had gone in with three of his buddies to buy a cow worth of meat from this butcher in Greenbrier, Tennessee, about 20 miles north from here. And he asks my brother and I if we wanted to go with him. And we're like, yeah, sure. You know, why not? Hey, that sounds fun, I guess. Um, so we're on our way to this butcher and we stopped to fill up because we were running low on fuel. And we stop at this sit go station. And at the corner of the station, there's this historical marker that says Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery. One mile east on Long Branch Road, Charles Nelson opens the Greenbrier Distillery. You're like, holy shit, what is this? You know, the, my name's Charles Nelson. And, you know, at first it didn't really, it was like, well, there are a lot of Charles Nelsons in the world probably. And so anyway, you know, we go on to the butcher who happens to live about a mile east. When we get there, we ask him if he knows anything about the old distillery. And uh, his name was Chuck Grissom. He was uh, amazing. I actually just randomly a couple weeks ago, someone was like, oh, my gosh, Chuck Grissom is my cousin. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we get there and we ask him if he knows anything about the old distillery. He's like, well, hell, you know, look across the street. So we walk across the street. There's this old barrel warehouse still standing. The original spring is still running. We go and drink from the spring, and then he sends us to a nearby historical society where there were two original bottles of our Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey with our name on them. And my brother and I just look at each other, and you know, like literally every hair on my body stood up, and it was like one of the only moments of clarity in my life. And you know, it was just like, man, this is this is what we're here to do. And it, it, the sign was literally a sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and the funny thing is, um, so I this is kind of silly, but I had uh, I, the year before I had like studied abroad in Paris and then traveled around Southeast Asia, and I was reading like a bunch of different books. And one book that I was reading was all about like reading the signs and like you know not actual signs, <laughs> but like you know trying to follow like energy and stuff like yeah, and stuff, yeah yeah that sort of thing and then you know you saw the chakra around the side <laughs> you're like this is it it's, it's for me yeah so uh when we saw those bottles like andy and i were just like holy shit this is like neither of us really knew what we wanted to do in life and you know i still had a semester of college left he was just fresh out of college and he was like an interning at the uh, country music association and yeah, so we're just like, this is this is it. And at the time, there you know, were only maybe a dozen distilleries in the country making whiskey, at least that we knew of. And there were only two in Tennessee that we knew of, Jack and George. And so we're like, well, there's definitely room for us. Um, there's no doubt about that. Why has this not happened before? And um, our great uncle... Um, apparently he and another cousin of his back in the eighties talked about trying to resurrect the company, but they were both like, you know, had their own careers and were very successful and everything. And it was just like the laws back then were a lot more difficult to change. And yeah, he, didn't Tennessee have some crazy, like only two distilleries. You said the two, they could be the only ones that there's no new distilleries could be opened or 
Yeah, well, uh, I mean, there it was only legal in three counties. Okay, um, yeah. Lincoln, Coffee, and Moore County. And then, you know, of course, Pritchard's opened up in, uh, I think, in Lincoln County. And then I think uh, Dickel and Jack were in Moore and Coffee. And then, actually, uh, this was then during the uh, recession, uh, Perry County, uh, not many people knew that Perry County opened up. They actually passed, they were the most depressed county in the state, and so they passed a law. They were the fourth county to legally be able to um, distill in, and they kind of like rolled out the red carpet for us and wanted us to come and build a distillery there, but you know, we wanted to do it either in the original county or in, which was Robertson County, or in Nashville. And so we were getting prepared to like do a referendum and like try and get a bunch of signatures and go around door to door because that's what you had to do. And then we heard about this effort um, by, you know, folks like, you know, Derek Bell and Jim Massey and, um, you know, uh, Mike Williams and a number of other folks here in Nashville who were leading an effort to change the law to open, uh, like, novel idea, change the law. Hey, hmm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> we need commerce. Yeah. Um, and so we're like, well, hell yeah. Then we could maybe do it in Nashville. And, you know, we still want to get back to Robertson County as well. But that effort succeeded in 2009, I believe. And, and we actually officially reformed our company in 2009, which was exactly 100 years after my family's distillery shut down. Uh, which was 1909. Wow, another son. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think I caught that. So it was actually part of your family, like lineage. That that distillery. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Uncle. Oh, okay. And yeah, yeah. Well, no, so it was. It was my great 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 grandfather, triple great grandfather, Charles Nelson. And so it, it's actually a fascinating history of how. Thank God they didn't give you a different name. You'd be like, well, <laughs> it's just Nelson. Yeah. This, <laughs> this son didn't turn out so well. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, what and, if it said Andy Nelson instead? <laughs> would y'all have still done it? Well, I, I guess then Andy would probably be right. here today yeah, instead yeah. of me. No, Andy just couldn't make it today. But um, yeah, it's it's funny. Like in my family, you know, either there's a pretty good chance you're either named Charles or William. So the original Charles Nelson, he came over from Germany in 1850. And his real name, uh, well, his German name was Carl Wilhelm Dietrich Nelson. And uh, so when he got to America, it just became Charles Nelson. Yeah, we got to shorten that up yeah. a little bit, <laughs> cut that middle part out. <laughs> and uh, so his firstborn son was Charles and his secondborn son was William. So it's like you're supposed to, I guess, name like like my first. I don't have any kids, but if I had uh, a son, I, my, I would be supposed to name him Charles. Then my second born William. And then my brother, his first name is William, his firstborn son would be named William and his second Charles. So it would get that really, would be really confusing at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully your wife or significant other is on board with that. Yeah. Like, sorry, you don't get to choose the name. <laughs> yeah. My, my fiance. Yeah. She, so she's Cuban. And so she might be trying to pitch Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's still good. So now we're, we're in 2009, 2010. Um, what's the next step? Is it, is it, let's go ahead and build a distillery is it let's source like what's the what's the thought process here like when you try to try to put a business plan yeah so so actually when we discovered it it was 2006 and that's when we started working on a business plan and trying to raise money and and going around to all the distilleries in Tennessee and Kentucky and you know meeting with a lot of these guys who you've probably had on the show and some legends um and, you know, everybody was so nice and helpful and willing to give advice and guidance. And, you know, we had no idea what we were doing, but we knew that we needed to bring somebody out to, you know, be an expert and to help us, you know, at least teach us what we didn't know. So we ended up going around for, you know, we spent a couple of years in state archives and county archives learning about the history of our family's distillery and just like history of distilling and you know in relation to tennessee and tennessee whiskey and doing a lot of research on our family's history and then we went searching for an expert and we narrowed it down to two people uh lincoln henderson and dave pickerel and two so, great people absolutely. Yeah. yeah and so lincoln you know he and my dad were were you know buds and got along really well and 
Um, I mean, they weren't like best friends or anything, but they were, you know, they were talking a lot. And so, um, you know, Lincoln ultimately said, Hey guys, you know, I, I love what you're doing, love to help out. And he was spending a lot of time in Japan, um, working on some Japanese whiskeys and also doing stuff with Brown Foreman. And anyway, uh, he said, but you know, I'm thinking about starting this thing with my son. So I, I'm probably not going to be able to, to you know, help out too much, but happy to do a little bit what I can. And he did uh, provide some really good guidance. Uh, and obviously that turned into Angel's Envy. And then, you know, Dave, we love Dave. Um, he had just left Maker's Mark and he was maybe consulting with one other company at the time. And so he had the full picture, you know, he, he knew he could, you know, being a chemical engineer, he could talk like you know, he could make you understand a complex subject, but speak, you know, in layman's terms. And we loved that. And so, you know, we spent a lot of time with Dave and we tried to sign him up full time and we had enough money to pay him, uh, for three months. <laughs> and, you know, I was like, man, so now comes the fundraising time. And I was like, man, we know some people with some money like that shouldn't be a problem we'll be able to raise a few million dollars in three months no problem and about two and a half years later we hadn't raised a penny oh, um, gosh. And so uh, you know i was living with my parents and like you know literally like trying to search through saved up coin jars and stuff like that yeah. to buy like ramen noodles and peanut butter and <laughs> jelly out cleaning out the couch for quarters yeah exactly. exactly yeah i mean, I mean you're in it's definitely it was a different climate back then when yeah nobody knew the, the the boom that would happen in 2013 time frame so i mean it was it was, it was, it was, a, huge, it never it was a huge gamble was like yeah like and nobody knew the industry i mean it was like you want to start a whiskey business <laughs> yeah good luck uh it's not healthcare. it's not technology like sorry i don't know that business and good luck you know great story, good history, good luck. And so anyway, um, uh, you know, Dave was like, after three months, he was like, guys, um, I'd love to continue helping you out and I will because I believe in you, but I've got to take on other clients. And we're like, okay, totally understand, you know? And during that time, he still helped us refine the business plan. And like, there was one, uh, potential investor, like, you know, you're, you're, how old are you? Um, at the time I was probably like 25 or 26 or something. He was like, yeah, um, I think for a CEO, we need someone a little bit more experienced. So Dave was like, look, I'll, I'll play the role or have the title of CEO if it appeases that investor and he's able to bring it in. But, uh, you know, you're going to be the one running the show. So, uh, you and your brother, anyway, that didn't end up working out, but, um, the way that we got started was initially our plan was to raise several million dollars, build out the whole distillery, hopefully on the original property, start laying down barrels of our Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey and not sell anything until they were aged for a few years. And, you know, nobody <laughs> were like, yeah, good luck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're like, so you're telling me you want me to invest, you know, millions of dollars and not start generating any revenue for at least a couple of years? Solid business. Plan. Yeah. <laughs> next. Thank you, next. <laughs> yeah. So that's when uh, we started. Dave uh, told us about the fact that we didn't have to start distilling on our own right away. And uh, we met a few brokers. And, you know, during the time in which we were doing a lot of research, we found that Bell Mead was one of 30 labels that Charles Nelson, my triple great grandfather, produced. And that out of those 30 labels, there were a handful that he produced in conjunction with other companies. Bell Mead was one of those. So like everything we do, we're trying to keep in line with the history of the original. And so that's why we came out with Bell Mead first. And so it was actually, it was kind of crazy. Like the way that it happened, like we, we would actually have brokers come to my parents' house with like a briefcase full of barrel samples. Like this doesn't like traveling barrels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Like, like seriously, this does not happen anymore. No. And over the course of like a year, this was in, I don't know, like Oh nine, something like that. It's hard to remember the years that kind of all blend together, yeah. but, but yeah. it's been a little bit of a rocket yeah. ride. Haven't you? Yeah. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we would taste different barrel samples from different distilleries, different mash bills, different yeast strains at different ages 
start at cask strength and then, you know, start diluting them down, rate our favorite barrels. You know, we started off doing like 10 or 12 in a day. And then we're, and you know, we'd start off in the morning on like a Saturday or Sunday or Friday or Wednesday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Whatever ends in Y. Whatever yeah. day. <laughs> but um, yeah, so then we were like, okay, that's too many to really, like at the end of it, we'd just be drunk and our palates would be shot. So we'd start limiting it to like five or six. And, you know, my brother and I don't tend to agree on, on most things, but, uh, when we do, I think it's kind of a beautiful thing. And, um, we, we finally agreed on what the, the blend would be for Bell Mead. And it came down to two things. There was, we actually really liked a blend that was coming from another distillery and we were like, okay, it's between that and, uh, the blend that was coming from LDI at the time, now MGP. And it was just like a coin toss. And then uh, we found out that the blend from the other distillery, which they're, they're you know, similar taste profiles, uh, they said that if we were going to use that, we would have to blend in, like, I think at least 40 or 50% from another source. And we're like, oh, well, we spent all this time, you know, not them. knowing yeah, this. So, the beginning. so um, then we, we chose the the LDI blend and, and, um, loved it. And, you know, we were super excited about it and we, we sold our first bottle in March of 2012. And the way that we bought those barrels was basically my family and I, we put up literally everything that we owned to personally guarantee a loan to buy a batch of barrels. And it, it was basically my parents' house was the most valuable thing <laughs> that we collectively owned and that allowed us to buy some barrels then buy some more barrels rate them once we sold our first bottle in march of 2012 how big was the first um, batch four barrels four barrels um i mean we bought more yeah, yeah, yeah. Than, but we the recipe was based on a four barrel blend and really still is today but yes yeah, so then we were able to raise some money and build out this place uh which we opened to the public in 2014 uh our first date of distillation was actually august 11th of 2014 which that today i don't even know what day it is <laughs> or i guess it we is. can't talk about the day <laughs> we can <laughs> the day of this recording is august yeah, 11th the day of this recording. How happy, weird. happy anniversary yeah no wonder you're ready to drink <laughs> <laughs> congratulations um, the first barrel that we laid down was august 14th of 2020 though but uh yeah, and then uh, opened our doors to the public November 23rd and, you know, then uh, sold our first bottle of our Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey October 1st of 2019. So that's that's the brand that we set out to produce and it only took us 13 years to get to the starting line. Yeah. I mean, when you when you think about it, though, you know, Bell Mead has had a lot of success, right? I mean, it's had a lot of success, especially in the, the bourbon geek world. Do you see that? I mean, do you consider that your flagship or do you consider the, you know, the, the Nelson's Tennessee whiskey to kind of be that? Like, wh where do you want to see these brands go? Yeah, so um, our Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey was one of the largest and most popular brands in the country prior to Prohibition. So like in 1885, we were selling like 380,000 cases a year. Wow. That's a, that's a lot that's for a back then. Up. Yeah, that's like <laughs> 2 million bottles a year. Yeah, I mean, for anybody and, that doesn't know, like that's what like Maker's Mark was doing like when they were getting, when they were getting ready to start really getting big in like 2012, 2013 timeframe. So yeah. So we were by far the largest distillery in Tennessee prior to Prohibition. And that brand, the Nelson's Greenbrier brand, was the, the flagship. Bell Mead was kind of a smaller uh, brand. And, and, you know, Bell Mead was always meant, uh, initially, it was meant to be a bridge to get us to Greenbrier. And, you know, it's, it's been a beautiful, nice, delicious brand. Um, and, you know, our plan is to keep it going and uh, we, we love it. Um, but the, the focus is on the Nelson's Greenbrier brand. And, and, you know, like I said, we had about 30 different labels back in the day. We had multiple Tennessee whiskeys, multiple bourbons, corn whiskeys, rye whiskeys, a malt whiskey, apple brandy, peach brandy, even gin. We actually uh, bottled one of the first American gins. 
you know, in the other room there, I can show you some of them. We've got a, a bunch of those bottles, but. I kind of want to talk about the labels there for a second, yeah. because talk about what it is to like go and dig into the archives when it comes to actually like getting the label. Does it, does something like that, like, did it go defunct? Did you have to like reapply for it? Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. So I've got to admit, I'm sort of a honey addict. I use it for dipping chicken tenders, I combine it with some cured meats on a nice charcuterie board, and I mix it with my bourbon cocktails when making hot toddies or a gold rush. But lately, I've been enjoying all that with a little bit of a kick. And Fire Bee Honey is your go-to for spice. Fire Bee Spicy Honey is all natural and can pair with almost anything. Fire Bee opens up a whole new world of sweetness with no added sugars. You can enjoy flavors such as elderberry, vanilla, cinnamon, and chocolate as it comes alive. Fire Bee is offering a special promotion for Bourbon Pursuit listeners. Get 15% off your purchase when you order two or more bottles by using the link at firebeehoney.com slash bourbon pursuit. That's firebeehoney.com slash bourbon pursuit for 15% off your purchase of two or more bottles. When it comes to actually like getting the label, does it, does something like that, like did it go defunct? Did you have to like reapply for it? Like was the trademark lost? Like was it still in the family? Like how did you, how did you navigate? Or the DSP, did you, did you get the same DSP or how's that work? Uh, yes. Okay. So there's a few questions. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> throw that in at the end. Um, okay. So it'll help to go back a little bit the history of Bell Mead bourbon. So it was uh, Charles Nelson, you know, had one of the largest distilleries in the state, by far the largest in the state, one of the largest in the country. And he was one of the first to bottle and sell whiskey rather than selling it by the barrel or the jug. So he had a lot more warehousing and bottling capabilities than most people in the state of Tennessee at the time. So there was another distillery, the Bell Mead Distillery, that was owned by the Sperry Wade and Company. And they distilled Bell Mead and Charles Nelson aged and bottled it. In the 1880s, I believe, the Bell Mead distillery burned, and that's when Charles took on more production of Bell Mead. There you go. Um, Good little history lesson. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's the, the, uh, the family from like uh, Alton Wade Kelly, uh, he's a descendant of the, the Wade part of uh, Watson Wade, uh, who was one of the proprietors there. So I found that we sold Bell Mead from an old price list that had a, you know, a bunch of different brands that we sold. And we ultimately found like this old newspaper article. We've got it framed in the tasting room from May 1st, 1885. That's an ad for Bell Mead. And it's got the label on it and everything, which is almost identical to the label that we use today. And so that's how, how we use that. Now, as far as the DSP number goes, um, Back in the day, we were known as old number five because we were registered distillery number five. And, and we've got, you know, a list of all the registered distilleries in the country and, you know, specifically a page from the list of the registered distilleries in the state of Tennessee. And the federal government recognized that fact and gave us an historic designation of DSP, Distilled Spirits Plant, TN, Tennessee 5. So, you know, we're very proud of that. And That's very we, cool. we put that on, on our bottle, like embossed on the back of our bottle there and on the punt of the bottle. And uh, we should. I think we it's very something to be very proud of. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you're, you're in early, right? I mean, you got a low number. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's nothing sexier than like a six digit. You know, DSP. <laughs> one five oh three yeah, yeah. two one. <laughs> exactly. So that's my luggage combination. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess the one thing that I didn't also, you know, with the 30 different labels, you know, how when you had to go to the archives, I mean, I know I said Bell Mead as an example, but like, did you find that, you know, these labels were like they had passed 
any kind of like ownership or anything like that? And like you had to like reapply for it or like, was it still in the family? Like, how did that work? Yeah. So we had to, we had to reapply for it. Um, I, there's after a certain amount of time passes and they're not, um, if it, it may be as short as like three or five years, if it's not used in commerce at, and you're not reapplying for it, then the, yeah. uh, trademark status dies and, you're not fighting to defend it any more than somebody else can come in. And, uh, but there, those trademarks were, you know, nobody had them. So fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah we have 30 more to you know, yeah, buy for us. Yeah. So. No, no <laughs> cease and desist yet. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. So talk about the, the Greenbrier, uh, your, you said your focus is going to be on the Nelson Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey. Yeah. Did you have recipes from back then that you were able to dig up? And is it like similar to that or is it like, your own thing yeah yeah so um we've actually got at least uh, you know multiple recipes um from back in the day and um so this one is based on you know one of those original recipes so we found a couple newspaper and actually most of what we've found is from old newspaper articles and back in the day at the distillery the fourth of july was a big deal um, because charles nelson was born on the fourth of july 1835 and uh, every year there'd be big celebrations at the distillery. There were articles written about the distillery all the time, and there would be tours at the distillery. And it also talked about like the bands that would play. And I think there was like Beck's beer that was served. That's the, cool. Yeah. And uh, talk about like the silverware, the serving platters. Anyway. It's like so, a Gatsby moment. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It, it really was. So they, uh, Mr. Uh, Gosh, I'm blanking on his name right now. Let's call him Mr. Watt. Yeah, the, the <laughs> Mr. Watt. <laughs> oh gosh, I'm totally blanking right now. Anyway, the head of production, um, he was giving a tour to a bunch of people, and there was a journalist on the tour, and he went through the whole process. First, we grind up 103 bushels of wheat and cook it to 212 degrees. Then we cool it down and add in 28 bushels of wheat, and so on and so forth, and went through wow, the whole process awesome. step by step. And they wrote because it down. Somebody documented it. Yeah. yeah. And so wrote it down and published it the next day. And then there was another article that was published um, that was like a visit to the prosperous concern of Nelson's Greenbrier <laughs> Distillery, where they mash twice daily using, you know, X bushels of corn, rye, Y bushels of wheat, and Z bushels of rye, and A bushels of barley, <laughs> you know, a day. And so we were like, okay. So you know, at first when we saw that we had a weeded mash bill, we were like, oh, that's crazy. Then we had learned that Robertson County, Tennessee, grew a lot of corn and a lot of wheat back in the day. And then we also have found like a four grain mash bill. And, you know, there's like articles of them getting in rye that I think was like coming through Chicago or something. I don't know. I, but um, it's a lot of a lot of things to start so, digging so in the archives. Yeah. So when you get all these recipes and you're like, all right, Dave, I got all these recipes that my grandpa made. What do you think of them? What, is it, what does he think of them? When they, he, when he was they, like, this is awesome. Yeah. Let's, let's do it. And he was, like, he was like, this is not that surprising because he was saying, he was like, this is not dissimilar from other mash bills that I've seen. And he was like, back then there wasn't a ton of creativity in terms of mash bills that like. So you didn't get the move Drake cast from like, uh, <laughs> or a honey barrel from uh, <laughs> news clippings. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, something that we love to do is like Charles Nelson was kind of a man ahead of his time. Uh, and so we, we like to try and uh, be innovative in, in some ways, but no, there was they, no, uh, no mention of any honey barrels or, or at least <laughs> not finishing in honey or move. <laughs> casks um but uh but yeah it was, it was interesting because like i guess a, a lot of people used similar mash bills back then and probably same today yeah i mean i guess another question is did were you able to find an old bottle or something like that and then have because i mean we hear about all the time they're like you know i've got an old brand i want to start up and i found this old bottle in my grandma's closet and i found out it was my great grandfather's and now I take it to, you know, Peggy No Stevens or somebody else and they try to, you know, dissect, decipher what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in just maybe uh, 150 feet from us, we've got uh, some of those original bottles. Probably got about 30 or 40 of them. 
some of the original Tennessee whiskey, uh, some rye from 1899 that's 126 proof. Um, wow. And uh, we've got some what we think may be that gin. Uh, we've got some fortified you wine. Think it's gin. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you think it's gin. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we've got some apple brandy. Yeah, so we, we have a bunch of original bottles, but we haven't tried them yet. I was about to say, you yeah. don't open them like every 4th of July like the, I, in celebration? Well, we we need to. Um, we, we've opened one of the bottles of Angelica wine because it was just easy to open. And it was, it tasted like a, you know, fine port basically. And I actually talked with uh, John Troya from Tempest Fugit Spirits about it. And uh, he thinks that it probably would have been more bitter, like a Fernet back in the day, but that that bitterness like probably broke down and turned into, you know, sweet. From the oxidizing or whatever, whatever goes on in the bottles. goes on <laughs> there. Yeah. yeah. Now, I do want to talk about some of the stuff that you had, you had poured for us here. So yeah. I, I want to start with the left, which was the um, the single barrel, right? I think this was... Uh, it was as, it was it, funny when we were... Before, he was like, this is my favorite barrel. And then the next one, well, I, this was my, <laughs> my favorite, favorite barrel. barrel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I also said that uh, I don't live in the quality yeah, binary right. world. No, I, but, I'm the same way. Yeah. <laughs> They're all my favorite. Yeah. Um, so so kind of talk about, you know, the idea behind, you know, some of the releases, the different finishes, single barrels, cash drink, you know, regular offering. Like kind of talk about, you know, the thought process of building the Bell Meat brand. Yeah, so um, when we first started, um, and like sourcing was not like well known, and we were doing two different mash bills and two different yeast strains, and people like you know were giving us a lot, like, and we were pretty open and transparent about that that we were sourcing and everything, and we lost out on a lot of sales, and then sourcing became a lot more well known, and then it was like. Now everybody's like, if it's not MGP, I don't want it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so we were like, well, how can we do something that like, we already are putting our own sort of touch on it by using the two different mash bills and two different yeast strains, but how can we go beyond that? And that's when we started looking to like scotch and, you know, their use of sherry casks. And so that's, we, our first foray into sort of experimentation was with sherry casks. Then we got some cognac casks and then some Madeira casks. And then we were like, well, let's go a little bit further and let's do some other crazy stuff. Then the owner of the Withers Winery is a friend and he likes bell meat bourbon. And so we got some Mavedra casks from him. I don't even know what Mavedra is. It's, yeah. So, um, it's a, wine, wine. Wine. it's a wine, yeah. Okay, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently, it's uh, apparently you know like a, a blend. It's not of for like, the peasants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't, um, can't pronounce it. Yeah. This uh, this I struggle on Grigio. So. This accent aigu uh, lends. It's like adds fifty dollars to the bottle right exactly. there. Mm -hmm. um, but this first single barrel, this is this is uh, amazing. Yeah. yeah, you talk about. Uh, I almost get like coconut off of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one's crazy. So no, that's that's a fantastic barrel. And I guess, um, you know, you know yeah, we, all, right. we all know that getting to the sourcing game, it's tough, right? I mean, it's, it's very capital, very intensive business. I mean, do you all see, now that you kind of like, you know, you kind of see it like on the horizon, what's happening with the, you know, the Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey, do you feel like you're going to start sunsetting a little bit of the Bell Mead, like not putting an emphasis on it? Like, where's, where's your head there? Yeah, I mean, the, the focus from the very beginning was while we're, you know, we love that we've, been able to get some great success with Bell Mead. The focus has always been and and will probably always be on our Nelson's Greenbrier brand. That was the brand like we had no intention of being of building like a small brand and a small distillery. Like we didn't even know that those existed. And they didn't really when we first started on. Like the smallest distillery that we visited uh when we were first trying to learn about this business was like Dickel you know, and that's not that that's small not, of a distillery. No, and we were like, large. we were like, well, we could just build a small distillery like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, thinking back to that, we we're like, oh, yeah. And now we're sitting in something like what we yeah, put we'll out. Yeah, that big in, Na in the middle of Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sell it now and get your property values yeah, back. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, but uh, so like we got into the business to, we wanted to become the biggest Tennessee whiskey again or at least the second biggest you know 
Um, or third. Or third. You know, <laughs> even even third think pretty heavy good. with third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a pretty good chunk of the pie yeah, there. You yeah. can't really say bad about third. Times have changed a little <laughs> bit since 2006, but um, you so know, what do you say to uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the fans out there that are you know Bell Mead diehards and big fans? Uh, you know, like go down, stock up. Like is that is that is that your <laughs> uh, is that your advice? I mean, I think it's always a good idea to buy more Bell Mead bourbon. You know, <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> no matter what what the future holds, <laughs> all the time, every time, anytime. Hey, go on, get you some. Um, <laughs> you can never but, have enough. Yeah, we're always trying to put out a good quality product at a reasonable price and whether it's under the Bell Mead brand or the Nelson's Greenbrier brand or future brands that are yet to be uh, launched. And so like we, we want to continue to put out products that we love and that have some sort of historical significance uh, in all likelihood, um, because most everything that we do, we, we take some inspiration from the past. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I would say for the fans, the folks that are, are big fans of Bellmead Bourbon, to keep an eye out on the Nelson's Greenbrier brand too. It's only, you know, in limited distribution, mostly in Tennessee and like Kentucky, South Carolina. But Bellmead is, you know, we started out the year with the goal of launching Bellmead Bourbon in all 50 states. So that's a lot of ground to cover. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we were already in like 30, so we we had a, or I don't know, 20 something. So, you know, we, we did a lot of virtual launches, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're not in all 50 states quite yet, but uh, we will be very soon, so. Well, I mean, I would say this uh, Mavardre, Mavardre, I can't say <laughs> it. It's, <laughs> it's delicious. I don't know. It's delicious. Maverde. Maverde. Yeah, sure. Whatever. Say what you want. But no, there is there is one here in the lineup that, that we got to talk about because this is, um, it broke the internet for a little bit. And that's this oh, honey wow. cask. This honey cask. Like, talk about the idea of the honey cask. And then did you ever see like the writing on the wall that somebody that they're like, this is going to be huge. <laughs> like, and because man, just talk about it. Yeah. I mean, the honey cask was just kind of, like I said, we like to, we like to play around a little bit. And, um, you know, some of our production crew, uh, every year does something for like the, um, national honey spirits summit, which actually didn't really have much to do with the honey cask, but we just, we love honey. Like honey's delicious. Who doesn't yeah. put in everything? Yeah, especially like chicken nuggets. Yeah, <laughs> especially chicken nuggets. Yeah. Um, anyway, you know, uh, we a lot of folks reach out to us all the time about buying or you know procuring our barrels for to age their beer or coffee or honey or hot sauce or whatever, and. We like to work with folks that are putting out really great products that we love. And True Bee Honey, it's another local company to Middle Tennessee. Uh, they make amazing honey. And so they wanted to age some of their honey in some of our barrels. And we're like, oh, cool. Yeah, we'd love to you know, do it. And we'd love to get some of that honey when you're done with it. And then they were done with it. And they were like, hey, would you guys like barrels back he's like you want this back i, I gotta get rid of yeah. the trash do you want it back <laughs> yeah. and we were like uh yeah actually that sounds really good uh so we did and we're like well let's throw some bourbon in there and we did and then we tasted it and we're like oh that's pretty dang good let's uh bottle that up and then you know love just like the horses on the label and we like to play around with that and so Putting the bees on there was just kind of a fun thing. And we had no idea that there, we, we were like kind of nervous that people would be like, really? It's not really, uh, it's not bourbon. I, yeah. It's not bourbon. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll have to say, I was in that camp. I yeah. was like, there's no way it's good. I mean, come on, how gimmicky can you get? Yeah. And then uh, one of my friends uh, in the Dallas Bourbon Club, Brian Lowe, gave me a pour of it. And I was like, I wanted to not like it, but I was so blown away. I was like, gosh, this is really good. It is. And it it's, is really good. It's like you can taste like almost the floral, like of, you know, the honey that 
you know, the flowers that it came from, from the bees. It's, yeah. you know, there's so much floral notes and it's crazy. Yeah. But yeah. it's it's not like, it doesn't take on like a viscous flavor where you feel like you're like, you know, like really chewing honey. I mean, it's just, it, it's just very, yeah, it's just very, got these very unique, balanced on it. Yeah. You're not getting like pounded by the. By no, the no. It's more like, like fruity and floral. Like, I don't know. Just yeah. Nectar wise. I don't know. I feel like if I'm a hummingbird, I would love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ooh, I don't know if I want to waste any of this on any hummingbirds, but, <laughs> <That'd> uh, <hurt. laughs> I, would. but I bet they would love it. Yeah. And they'd probably crash into the... I can't get them to come to my house. So maybe that's <laughs> what I need, a bottle of honey. <laughs> Bell meat honey. But I mean, this I was... get squirrels. So. Yeah, yeah, we all get that. So, but this was also a bottle that on the secondary market, it was going for, I mean, it's asinine what it's going for, you know, like yeah. four or $500 a bottle. What are your thoughts on that? Are you like, oh, good for them? Or are you like, oh shit, that was a... Yeah, I mean, we actually knocked it out of the park. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's nice to hear that, and it's like oh, that's cool. But it, it's it's a double edged sword, especially when like people get upset with you about not being able to get or like waiting in line for a long time, and because you had another release of it, and people were like camped out to try. Yeah, to it. yeah. So that which sucks because like I, I, you know, we just don't think of ourselves or, or like. We're happy if one person buys a bottle. Right. <laughs> like, you know, so we knew that this release of the honey cask, um, the last one that we did was going to be popular, but, you know, we were like, we thought maybe, maybe 400 people max would show up. And um, the first people started showing up over 24 hours before the release. And we're like, what the hell? Like, what we're is, not selling this, Yeezys here. This is crazy. And an hour before we opened, you know, there were like over a thousand people lined up and, you know, I think we had maybe like, I didn't even know how many bottles that we had, but it was like 600 or something like that. And we're like, oh God, this is not good. Uh, there's too many people here. So, and I was telling my friends, I was like, Man, I mean, as long as you're here, like, around noon or yeah, something, before lunch, you'll, 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 be before lunch. <laughs> you'll be able to get a bottle. And so they're like, man, fuck you, dude. Like, <laughs> what the hell? Until he screwed me out of my you, honey. Yeah. And um, so there were a lot of people. And then there were people that got in line at, like, 8 a.m. that, you know, waited in line for, you know, I think that the line ended, I don't know, like, 3 p.m. or something. And there were some people that waited starting at like 8 a.m. that didn't get bottles and I felt so bad and like we were also raising money for tornado victim relief and you know we were able to raise over five grand um just from people here and then we ended up donating gosh all told I think we ended up donating over 50 grand That's fantastic. Um, to local tornado relief which was amazing but you know a lot of that uh was in large part thanks to the show out at the at the honey release and um so that was great but you know i hated seeing people waiting it was a hot day and like or actually it was it was i think it was cold night and then it got hot i don't know but uh the weather wasn't great and so you know i was going around like handing out bottles of water and stuff people were yelling at me and like <laughs> i was getting like threats and there was, it was Does just Does it make like, you want to do another release or you kind of like, ah, <laughs> just don't want to deal with, deal with this anymore? I, yeah. After that, honestly, it was like, I mean, I love it because it's great and the people that all get it love, it. we just got, we've got to figure out how to do it better and, you know, take there, it. There's to, no good way. You're going to, yeah. you're going to have people mad no matter what. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. And so. But yeah, it, it is a little discouraging at times when you get a bunch of nasty, you know, emails and direct messages on social media and letters and stuff. And people just like. People still write letters? Yeah. Yeah. Got <laughs> to get up into the mail. Like, like yeah. I'm really going to yeah, make a point. We get actual hate mail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter messages are a little bit more common. But yeah, yeah people, people actually do still write letters <laughs> and postcards. And yeah. I, it's hard for me just to find a stamp sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, dude, this was an awesome way to kind of sit down with you, learn more, especially about you, your family, the history. I know there's, there's a lot here that I didn't know about, and I'm excited to really know, you know learn more. We're going to have you on again at some point in the yeah. future. Yeah, I feel like I, we just scratched the surface. I, I agree yeah. with what's going on here. So, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. We'll and have to do it again on our next road trip back there. So yeah, yeah. Do that. And then maybe, sure. yeah, maybe you, you, like I said, you, you'll quit doing the honey thing so you don't piss any people yeah. off. And, <laughs> but I mean, it's also, I think it, you also have that feel good about it. You're like, yeah, like we got something, we put it on the map. Yeah. Right? So people, now people, you're calling the bee farmer like, you got to age more honey. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wish they could Take all our more. empty barrels now. I wish they could, but they, they're pretty small production. Um, but it's been funny because now like people text me all the time. They're like, Yo, this brand's doing a hundred, doing the honey yes, too yeah. now, and people are doing it on their so, own too. Yeah, a lot of copycats yeah, out there. So yeah, yeah. so it, you know, it feels good to Trend be. Centers. Yeah, so um, I guess copy is a compliment, you know. But yeah, it, and like seeing it, it, it can be frustrating seeing. So, like I've heard of it going on the secondary market for two grand or something like that. And on the one hand, I'm like, oh, awesome. But then I'm like, gosh, I feel bad. Like if someone paying paying that much that money much for money. my bourbon yeah, yeah. like yeah. we only charged like 150 or 20 or something i can't remember what it was anyway it's cool <laughs> no that's awesome and again thank you for coming on because this was a great to understand your story more about the products more about bell mead and you know the tennessee nelson greenbrier tennessee whiskey and really what the plans are for the future because i think that's something that people are always interested to kind of know about you know what are they yeah. interested in and what is the, what's the future going to entail for yeah. them? And it's, it's really great. So be, before we close it out, you know, give people a, a way that they can learn about more about, you know, you all, where they can follow you online, everything like that too. Yeah. So um, you can check out our website at greenbriardistillery.com or ngbd.com. Four letters that all sound like they could be hey, other letters. Four, letter <laughs> four letter domains are rare. Yeah. So you got one. So N as in Nelson, G as in Green, B as in Briar, D as in Distillery.com. Um, then NGB Distillery on Instagram or Nelson's Green Briar for the brand. Then we've also got BellmeadBourbon.com. We've got too much stuff. <laughs> you got all the web. And there's no consolidation yeah. whatsoever. <laughs> Just own all the web presence. Yeah. Well, that that's something that we've been talking a lot about is that how do should we consolidate and and you know focus more on you know one or yeah you can put on another label your social media teams like God damn it yeah. <laughs> go <laughs> register all the domains right yeah, now <laughs> you, you, yeah like we've already and we've also got Louisa's liqueur because. My triple great grandmother ran the distillery for the last 18 years. And that's another, you know, domain and another social media handle. We don't even have like one person can't manage all of the different <laughs> domain names. Like I think you can only do five at a time. <laughs> so we need to fix that. That's awesome though. But again, thank you for coming on. It was it was a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I mean, love the personality, the energy that you bring to this. You could tell there's a lot of passion behind it. And you know, it was, it was literally a sign that was a sign that made you build this. And it's, it's yeah, amazing to kind cool. of see the, the journey that you've come on when you're age of 25 and trying to start a business where people were kind of like, dude, you're crazy. Yeah. And, yeah. and now you're, you know, decade yeah, the, later, we got something here. Yeah. Yeah. And the notes you risked it all and your parents were like, oh, we finally made it to a point, you know, we can chill out. And then they're like, well, got to put the house up for, some, <laughs> for our son. So that's, that's very <laughs> awesome, you know, and I'm sure your triple great grandfather is like super proud of what y'all have done. So it's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're excited and we hope that he's looking down and, and that he is proud. And, and every 4th of July or, or actually every 3rd of July, the night before we go and do a toast at his, uh, uh, grave site and pour some out. He's for probably him. like poor honey this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, again, yeah. make sure you follow them on uh, all the social media handles. If you can find them, I'm sure there'll be a list out there somewhere. Check the, yeah. check the website first yeah. and then make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit at all the socials as well. And if you like what you hear, make sure you leave us a review, comment on wherever you're watching or listening to this. And if you want to help support the show, want to be a part of our community, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. With that, cheers, everybody, and we'll see you all next week.